Life can be bland without companions. This is why we have family and friends and people who don't judge us, love us unconditionally, and are always there for us. But how well do we actually know our friends? Keely Bunker, after a late night out on September 19th of 2019, was heading home to be well rested for a job interview later that day. Now, considering the direction this case took, you would think that she was walking alone at night, which is many people's worst fear. But she wasn't. Her friend was walking with her, someone she trusted to keep her safe. But if that's so, then why didn't Keely make it to her interview? Why was she reported missing the same evening? What happened to her on September 19th of 2019 when she was just 20 minutes away from her home, and that too with a friend? The case of Keely Bunker is darker and much more twisted than meets the eye, and it's a horrific tale of betrayal coming from where it's least expected. Keely Bunker was born on September 7, 1999, to parents Christopher Bunker and Deborah Watkins in Sutton Coldfield, West Midlands, England. Keely was described as a kind, compassionate, and loving girl. She had a very giving personality and wasn't afraid to put others first. When she was older, she helped her aunt to look after her cousin, who unfortunately had severe disabilities, along with her aunt's other children, just to make their lives easier. That's how helpful, kind, and generous Keely was. She loved people around her unconditionally and was a breath of fresh air for most people that knew her. As Keeley had experience taking care of children and it helped that she loved being around them, Keeley had dreams of becoming a school teacher. Her family said that there wasn't a more fitting profession perfectly tailored for Keeley than teaching. At the time of this case, Keeley resided in Tamworth, Staffordshire and worked at the Drayton Manor theme park while working on making her dreams of teaching a reality. In school and shortly thereafter, Keely was considered quite popular, but even so, she was very down to earth. She loved music as well, specifically the British rapper H. Sometime before the 18th of September 2019, Keely had actually bought concert tickets to see H perform at the O2 Arena in Birmingham as a birthday treat for herself. Keely was excited to no end, but just 12 days after her 20th birthday, while out with her friends, something horrible would happen to Keely it would become one of the most terrifying tragedies of Tamworth. After celebrating her 20th birthday, Keely and one of her close friends, Monique Riggin, went to see H's live performance at the O2 Arena in Birmingham on September 18th of 2019. Keely had a blast with her friend by her side, but after the concert ended, Keely wasn't ready to call it a night just yet. At around 10 p.m., the duo decided to hit a nearby club. But before they reached the club, they made a stop at the New Street Station to meet up with one of Keeley's friends, 20-year-old Wesley Street. Wesley was a childhood friend of Keeley's, and the two had known each other since they were little. They had mutual friends, and even though they didn't hang out much, Keeley wanted to invite Wesley for a fun night out, since they'd recently reconnected. Together, the trio reached a nightclub called Snobs, located in Tamworth, at around 10.40 p.m and all of them had a fun time with drinks and dancing. For the next four hours or so, Keeley had a couple of drinks, but was supposedly being quite responsible with her drinking. Wesley, on the other hand, went a bit wild. Finally, at 2.40 a.m., the friends decided to call it a night, and Monique proceeded to call a taxi to her house in Tamsworth. Now, Monique and Keeley actually lived pretty close to each other. Their houses were about a 20-minute walk away from each other, so it was all good. During the cab ride, Wesley had to make a stop in the middle because he wasn't feeling well. But finally, at about 3.30 a.m., the trio reached Monique's home. Since it was pretty late at that point, Monique asked if Keeley wanted to spend the night at her house. But Keeley declined the offer, as she had an interview for the position of assistant teacher at a local school at around 2 p.m. that same day. Even though Monique was still worried about Keeley getting home safely, she assured her by saying, quote, I've got Wes, I'll be fine. I'll walk with him and I'll be safe. Wesley also lived close to Keeley, so the plan was perfect. Keeley didn't have to walk alone at night, and she had her friend by her side. Anyway, at around 4 a.m., Keeley and Wesley left Monique's house, and Monique pleaded with Wesley to take Keeley home safely, and he assured her that he would, even though he was supposedly incredibly drunk. Fast forward to the later hours of September 19th of 2019, 
and Keeley's family was waiting for an update from Keeley about her night out and the interview, but they got no response from her. To make matters worse, by 6 or 7 a.m. that morning, Keeley still hadn't made it home. This is when they started to panic. Around 12.30 p.m., Monique also called Keeley to find out whether she'd reached home safely or not, but she got no answer or any message back from her. This radio silence from Keeley immediately prompted Monique to call Wesley. She thought that maybe Keeley had spent the night with him. Wesley answered the phone and said that Keeley wasn't with him. When asked about walking Keeley back home a couple hours ago, Wesley went on to explain that as they left Monique's house, he had to stop by his house as he was feeling nauseous again. Wesley left Keeley outside his home near a telephone box, and he assumed that Keeley walked by herself the rest of the way. Wesley thought that Keeley would be fine, but now, after talking to Monique and knowing that Keeley was nowhere to be found, he was feeling terrible for leaving her alone. And naturally so, he had one job. So Wesley, Monique, and Cameron Marsden, who was a close friend of Wesley, went out to look for her in the surrounding areas, but there was no sign of Keeley. Their fears were doubled when they learned that Keeley never showed up for the interview at 2 p.m. This was not normal for Keeley at all. She'd waited her whole life for this dream job, and she wouldn't miss it for the world. Monique immediately had a sinking feeling that something was not right. At around 5.30 p.m., Christopher, Keeley's dad, came home, and after still not hearing from Keeley all day, he immediately filed a missing person report, and Keeley was officially a missing person. The police immediately jumped into action once Keeley was reported missing. A 20-year-old girl who was living a good life and had an interview for a job that was perfect for her couldn't have just up and left. Keeley's disappearance shook the community of Tamworth, and everyone took part in the search for her. At around 9 p.m., it was getting dark, but the search for Keeley was still on, and people were using flashlights to look for something, anything, that could lead to Keeley. When the search party reached Wigington Park, that's when people heard a horrifying scream. An off-duty investigative officer named Dean Reynolds, who had also had a military background, described the scream as the most horrendous and fearful sound he'd ever heard. What was even more painful was that Jason Brown, Keeley's uncle, was the one who screamed, and that was because he discovered something that he didn't want to see. Even though it was dark, Jason wanted to look around Wigington Park, and when he reached a small and shallow pond, that's when he saw something. It was a body partially immersed in the pond, and when Jason shone some light on the body, something caught his eye. It was a glimmering of a bracelet, the same bracelet that Keeley always wore. When detectives and emergency services reached the pond, unfortunately, 20-year-old Keeley Bunker had already lost her life. Keeley's body was taken for an autopsy, and the news of her passing was given to her parents, who couldn't even believe what they were hearing. Their daughter had just turned 20 days ago, but now she was gone. Keeley's friends were also informed of her passing, and Monique was struck with incredible grief. She was battling with the gnawing feeling of sadness and guilt. She thought that she could have just forced Keeley to stay with her and then she'd still be alive. It was just unbelievable. The autopsy revealed several disturbing details about Keeley's passing. She was disrobed and there were signs of violation, which is just so heartbreaking to imagine what Keeley went through before her tragic demise. There were also a lot of defensive wounds on her body, mainly on her neck and arms, and her cause of death was compression to the neck. Now that the case had taken a grim turn from a missing person investigation to a full-blown homicide investigation, the police knew that they had to catch the perpetrator, and fast. Given the timeline and series of events a few hours before Keeley went missing, the investigators knew that they had to talk to the last person she came in contact with, and that was none other than Wesley Street. The police arrived at Wesley's home in Tamworth, and they just wanted to ask a couple of questions. They even took Wesley in the patrol car to help find the exact spot where he left Keeley a few hours prior. Now, this detail doesn't make much sense to me, because according to what Wesley told Monique, he left Keeley just outside the front of his house near a telephone box. But now he was having officers drive him around the area so that he could show them where he left her. I'm not sure if this detail was simply misreported by a news outlet, or if there's something more to this, but this detail seemed important to point out. At first, the detectives weren't suspicious of Wesley, as he was trying his best to cooperate. But a few minutes into the car ride, the investigators asked Wesley for his phone, but Wesley refused to hand it over. After a bit of coercion from the police, Wesley did what he was asked, 
but he proceeded to get defensive, saying that he felt as though the police were blaming him and that they thought he was the suspect. Now, this is extremely alarming. If your childhood friend had gone missing, you would try to do everything in your power to find them and help the authorities as much as you can, not get defensive about it. This behavior could be the result of one of two scenarios. Either Wesley was freaking out or being questioned by the detectives, or he may have had a hand in what happened to Keeley and was trying to save his skin. Needless to say, if the police weren't suspicious of Wesley before, they certainly were now. Anyway, all of this was going on at the same time that the search parties were looking for Keeley, and when Keeley's body was discovered, the investigators knew that Wesley's behavior wasn't weird for no reason. While still in the cop car, just a couple of hours into the search for Keeley, Wesley was arrested on suspicion of taking her life, and he was taken to the police station, where he was officially interrogated for the crime. Mind you, at this point, the evidence police had was quite shaky. Best I can tell, they had little more than a gut feeling about this man, simply because he'd been acting so strangely. Regardless, his DNA was taken and sent off to be compared with the DNA that was found on Keeley's body. What was odd was the fact that Wesley changed his story every single time new evidence was brought in front of him, which made him even more suspicious. First, he denied any involvement in Keeley's passing and said that they never engaged in intercourse and that they went straight home from the nightclub. But this story soon hit a wall when Wesley's phone records showed that a cell phone tower pinged close to the location of Wigington Park on the 19th of September after 4 a.m., confirming that he was indeed in Wigington Park. So there was no way that his story was true. This is when Wesley proceeded to change his tone. He told the detectives that he and Keeley did end up going to Wigington Park after leaving Monique's house, but they were a bit drunk, and Wesley playfully jumped on Keeley's back, causing her to trip and hit her head on a fence post, leading to her demise. But this story was quickly thrown to the side very quickly by detectives, as Keeley's autopsy confirmed there was no injury or blunt force trauma to her head, and her blood alcohol levels were lower than the legal driving limit. She may have been a bit drunk, but she wasn't nearly as intoxicated as he was. During this time, the DNA results came out too, and the DNA found on Keeley's body matched that of Wesley. So with this evidence, Wesley couldn't deny the fact that they had engaged in some sort of sexual activity that night. What the police wanted to confirm now was whether it was consensual or not. With that revelation, you guessed it, Wesley came up with another story. This time he said that while they were heading towards the park, Keeley was apparently giving Wesley flirty eyes. One thing led to another and they got intimate in Wigington Park. Wesley proceeded to say that during their consensual intercourse, he was holding Keeley's neck in an act of passion when he suddenly felt her body going limp. He tried to wake her up, but she passed away. This caused Wesley to panic and he dumped Keeley's body in the nearby pond. Now, I just want to push back on this claim for just a moment because claiming someone's life by strangulation is not like what you see in the movies. It's not something that can just happen without you realizing what's going on. It's not something that can happen in a matter of seconds either. It takes a tremendous amount of force and a surprisingly long amount of time. You wouldn't just feel someone going limp and let go and then realize it's too late. You'd have to feel them going limp, then keep at it for a couple more minutes, maybe even longer, depending on the person. But anyway, according to Wesley's story, after this supposedly accidental act, he made his way back home where he proceeded to take a shower and sleep. And it's just so chilling to know how unbothered Wesley was knowing that he'd taken his childhood friend's life and all he cared about was getting a good night's rest. But that's all operating under the assumption that his story was even completely true, and I personally don't buy it. Regardless, Wesley later confessed that during the early morning hours, he went back to the scene where Keeley's body was about five times to cover her up with branches and twigs so that no one would discover her. When the investigators asked why he didn't come clean about this from the get-go about what actually happened, Wesley gave the most baffling answer. He simply said that he was embarrassed and afraid and didn't know how to tell people how Keeley had actually died. Now, even though Wesley had confessed to taking Keeley's life, although by accident, well, the police were now getting a bit suspicious. Wesley's statements still contradicted the evidence that was found on Keeley's body. For starters, the defense wounds on Keeley's neck suggested that she was trying to loosen the hold that Wesley had on her, just like I described a moment ago. There's no plausible scenario when you can accidentally strangle someone. Whatever happened that night, it was not an accident, and it was not consensual. 
Also, when the clothes Wesley wore on that fateful night on Keeley's passing were tested, there were traces of Keeley's makeup, saliva, and even blood on the edge of the sleeves. All of this evidence suggested that whatever happened to Keeley was extremely brutal, and Wesley had every intention of ending Keeley's life. Up until Wesley's trial in July of 2020, he maintained his innocence and deemed Keeley's loss as an accident. But the prosecution wanted Wesley to receive punishment for what he did. Since Wesley was of no help and didn't come forth with a motive for ending Keeley's life, the police had no choice but to theorize it. They thought that Wesley was attracted to Keeley. Keeley was a beautiful, lively, and friendly young woman, the type of person nearly anyone could fall for quite quickly. Police theorized that after leaving Monique's house, Keeley and Wesley made their way to Wigington Park, and during that time, Wesley tried to make advances towards her. Keeley, who didn't feel the same about Wesley, turned him down. Now, this was just something that seriously angered Wesley. Wesley didn't want to hear the word no, and this was what caused Wesley to tackle Keeley to the ground, subdue her, and take advantage of her, all the while squeezing her neck. Keeley tried to put up a fight to make Wesley stop, which was when she was inflicted with defensive wounds. But in the end, Keeley unfortunately lost her life, and that too at the hands of her trusted friend, a friend who was supposed to protect her. On the flip side, the defense stuck to the accidental stance, and they tried to persuade the court by saying that Wesley and Keeley engaged in consensual activities, and Keeley was apparently, quote, enjoying herself. There was also an instance caught on CCTV that showed Wesley and Keeley going to the park, and it seemed like Keeley may have been pushing Wesley away. But according to Wesley in the defense, it was innocent play fighting. As for the prosecution, they had one more revelation to present to the jury, and this would determine whether what Wesley did was truly an accident or intentional. Ever since the news of Keeley's death and Wesley's arrest was made public, and the investigation was still ongoing, a number of women came forward with their horrific encounters with none other than Wesley himself. One young woman came forward and confessed that in 2015, she was only 16 years old, and Wesley followed her into a bathroom, locked the door behind them, and forced her to perform indecent acts on him. But that wasn't the end for this poor girl because she was cornered by Wesley again a couple of days following the first incident and forced himself on her again. Another young girl came forward and claimed to have been victimized by Wesley back in 2017 when she was also underage. In 2019, just months before Keeley's tragic passing, Wesley targeted another woman who was 20 years old, and his MO was pretty much the same. It's heartbreaking that none of these women came forward sooner, but the fear these young girls likely felt is unlike anything you could imagine, so it's certainly understandable. These women were very brave to come forward with what they endured at the hands of an evil man. And thanks to them, this case was about to get as simple as one could be. But it does beg two very alarming questions. How many women and minors did Wesley actually terrorize and violate? And could there be more of Wesley's victims out there who are still afraid to come forward? After the jury deliberated for eight hours, which is a surprising amount of time considering the evidence, they came forward with their decision. Wesley Street was found guilty of all charges, including the charges he now faced regarding the minors that he forced himself on. He was sentenced to a minimum of 30 years behind bars, but he will be eligible for parole after that time, which is terrifying to hear. Kiwi was a beautiful young woman who had lots of plans for her future, but everything came crashing down on the very day that she was looking forward to for so many years. She finally had made it. Her dream job was just an interview away and Wesley stole that from both Keeley and her family. Keeley's parents had a hard time wrapping their heads around the fact that Wesley, a young man that they considered to be like family, had such a dark side to him, and they never even anticipated that this man could take the life of their beloved daughter and ruin the lives of so many other daughters. After the sentencing, Keeley's family said the following, saying, quote, as Keeley's family, the outcome of this trial will never be enough in terms of justice. Keeley was the kindest, most caring, innocent young lady you could ever meet, and was only just starting out in her life. Such is the hell we feel. We're incapable of showing any forgiveness. On October 24th, 2019, Keeley's funeral was held at St. Edith's Church in Tamworth, and her parents requested attendees to pay homage to their daughter by pairing their black attire with something pink, as it was Keeley's favorite color. 
Hundreds of people, including friends, family, and close relatives, gathered to bid farewell to a girl with such a promising future. The case of Keeley Bunker depicts the alternate and very dark side of supposed friendships. It leaves you wondering whether you can trust a friend with your life or not. Keeley trusted Wesley to walk her home safely, but rather, he led her straight into the hands of danger. And this was the worst betrayal a friend could ever receive. We can only imagine how Keeley felt during her last moments, fighting for her life to get away from the person she trusted so deeply. In the end, Wesley managed to backstab all of the people who loved him like family. And for what? To what end? We can only hope that Keeley's family is, after these years, learning to heal from this tragedy and living their lives while trying to come to terms with the enduring loss of their wonderful daughter. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. I wanted to give a special thank you to some of the new channel members, including Jesse Lee Reed and Judy M. There are so many new members who joined the channel this month, but I just wanted to pick a couple of you guys at random and let you know just how much I appreciate your support. If you also want to become a member of the channel, you can gain access to new videos sometimes days or weeks before they're uploaded to the public, and it's currently the best way you can help keep the channel afloat and help out. I'm just, I'm so grateful to those of you who've decided to do that. If you want to join, you can click the big join button below this video, or if that button's not there, there's a link down in the description. I'm hoping we're going to have some news on the new merch store in the coming weeks. I'm just waiting on some new samples to be mailed in before we can actually, you know, officially announce anything. So be sure to keep an eye out for that in future videos and stay tuned into the community page as well, because I'll probably post the merch stuff there before it makes it into an actual video. But as always, if you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered. And don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.